And finally, before our final discussion, please welcome from London the director of Limitless, Graham Jacobs. Thank you. Good morning. So, uh, Limitless is a company that's been in existence for about 12 years, and we specialize in getting natural light into dark and windowless, spa windowless spaces. Now, one of the things I noticed very early on, thanks to staff, was that what you call a basement, we don't call a basement. <laughs> so, everything I'm going to talk about here is underground. It's not above ground. There's not an element of the window above ground. It's all underground. Okay? So, I'll start off by showing just a couple of before and after examples. So, the picture on the left is a basement in London in a fairly old house um, at the time the client bought it and you can see that it's wholly dependent on artificial lighting. On the right it's after we'd installed one of the basement light shafts and the basement light shaft, put it simply, is a system for getting natural light into underground basements. It has other benefits as we'll see shortly but you can see there's a significant difference between the two. Now, the reason for showing this, so this is a, a, another old building. This one happens to be near the uh, British Museum in London, three, 300 years old. And in this case, it's a classic example, old houses of that age in London. The basement actually goes out under the public street. So through that doorway, you can see our light source is above the doorway. It actually goes under the street. Um, and the light shaft that we've put in there provides bi-directional light. So it's sending natural light into the utility area beyond and back into this kitchen. So that, again, is a wholly underground space, wholly underground room. Now, the basement light shaft system, at its minimum, is designed to provide natural light. And it's taking natural light from an external environment and reflecting it and distributing it throughout the room. They are also very often ventilated normally about 70%, and that's actually become quite an important part of the way we've developed them, because increasingly architects and planners and building controllers are actually using the ventilation to meet ventilation standards. We started out as the single most, second most important element being what we call views. It's not, it's not specifically views. You don't see rolling hills and beautiful mountains and things like that. But what you do see is the sky. And as part of the code of practice for daylighting, which I'll come on to shortly, one of the really important things for anybody in a room is a connection with the external environment. It's very important to know what it's like outside and not just be in a box underground. I mean, we don't know what, what's happening outside right now. It could be a lovely sunny day. And the last element, which I won't talk about too much in, in this particular presentation, is we have development to allow people to get in and out of basements. Sorry, not in, out. <laughs> Um, this is an example. Um, now, this is, this is a classic example of one where we des it was designed for one purpose. This room is 800 square feet. That ceiling is 10 feet underground. And he's got four basement light shafts in there. And the room is full of light. And it was, it was originally set up as a sort of lounge, sort of breakout area. Um, two years later, everybody's moved their desks in there because they prefer to work in there in that light to the office they were in before which had much smaller windows and much lower levels of natural light. He's a very happy man. <laughs> right, now the reason for showing this slide is this is a house in West London. I focused as much as I possibly can on older buildings uh, because it's the kind of challenge that you've got here in New York. This is a house in Wimbledon. It's one of those houses um, on the hill near where the, they do the tennis championships. On the left there you've got a bedroom. The picture on the right is to show you where we're getting the light from. So you can see in this particular situation, it's a very narrow pathway. It's a very high fence because they really don't get on with their neighbors at all. And you can see that half the space at the top, there's overhanging eaves. So the amount of source of natural light isn't great. But we still manage to get to the code of practice for daylighting for a habitable bedroom. Now, those four covers there. The far two are the two that are providing the light shaft. The middle one is a fire escape, and the one at this end is a bathroom. And they're all ventilated. Offices in basements. I mean, we're in London, inside the M25, we're as congested as you, you are in New York. 
and people do anything. There's no stigma about basements. If you can get natural light and fresh air into them, people will work in them, live in them. That again is a bi-directional one. Can't really see it in this picture, but if you go through the door into the room beyond, the light is going the other way as well. Now I'll come onto the code of practice for daylighting in a moment, but the code is the system that's used for analyzing daylighting in habitable spaces. And it's not just habitable spaces in terms of habitable residential, but classrooms, hospitals, offices, etc. And every type of room, the use for which it's intended, has a different level under the code. So the code for a bedroom or a nursery, or the level, the ADF level, is lower than for a kitchen. But the algorithms that are used to calculate it use the same basis. But you have to be able to prove that on a flat, dull, overcast day, you can achieve the code. So looking at the benefits of the basement light shaft system, and bear in mind this is the fully underground version, not the semi-underground basement. We talk about enhanced daylight. It's not, it's, I, I, I struggle to find the right word there, but we make much better use of the available daylight and we distribute it well through the room. Because one of the things that the code of practice says is that you should get good average illuminance at the working plane throughout the room. So it's about distribution. You can't amplify it. As I've already mentioned, 70 to 80 percent of them are vented systems. And when you look at this basement light shaft, you know what's happening outside. You know what, the, what kind of day it is. So in a lot of cases, it's allowed people to take basement spaces that would not qualify to be lived in, uninhabitable spaces, and made them habitable spaces. Oh, and there's that egress option again. The way they're designed, they're very low maintenance. London's a city that has, you know, as much crime and burglary as anywhere else, and we have to design them so you fit and forget and people can't get through them. So we have, backing it up, we have two different uh, light shaft systems. One's the above ground one, which I'm not talking about today, and the other one's the below ground one. We've got um, a performance-based compliance system that's backed up with a very clever set of software that was written for by an independent party for us. They're suitable both for new build and retro. The deepest we've gone so far is three and a half stories and still complied with the code of practice. It's always a tailor-made solution because one of the things we've learned is that no two buildings are the same, so we have to make it. But it's like anything. We all know that tailor-made, it's a whole series of components and it's just the way you put it together and it's the length and the depth that's actually the only thing that changes. It enhanced space utilization without a shadow of doubt, improved property values. People say to us that, you know, the improvement in the property value is greater than the cost of installing the system. We also know the improvement in the amenity value and the usability of the space is greater. And I mentioned security. So the reason for showing this slide, this was another one where we, uh, the BRE who wrote our software for us came and did some analysis and did some measurement in the middle of that room and discovered that the two light shafts on the side of the room, which aren't particularly large, were delivering more and a better distribution of light through the room than the huge light well at the end. This is a typical light well section. So as you can see, we're fully underground here. Yeah? So when people say to us, I want to do a basement light shaft, we can either send that to them and they work to that, or we can send that to them and tell us, say, well, what have you got? And we'll tell you how much light we can deliver. So examples of the top covers of the basement light shafts, left-hand side, unvented, fully flush. The one in the middle, she's put it in her flower bed and now tells me that she can see the plants as well as the sky. And the one on the, one on the right is a ventilated system. Again, fully flush. These are pedestrian load bearing. Um, later this year, we're doing our first vehicle load bearing ones. Two classic examples. The earlier picture I showed you of the building near the British Museum where it went out under the street, that's that picture on the right. So the basement actually goes beyond the pavement and under the street. Classic thing that's happening a lot in London at the moment is big old pubs uh, going out of business as pubs and being converted. So that building, the ground floor, we call it the ground floor, I think you'd call it the first floor, and the basement are office accommodation. Those are the light shafts which are vented, which allow it to be used as an office because it has to hit, hit a higher ADF, daylight factor. And then the upper stories are residential. And I say increasingly, particularly since the tragedy of the Grandfell Fire in London, there's much more emphasis on um, fire safety. So that you can see just in the picture in the left-hand one, there's a classic London bay window. 
the middle there's a basement light shaft delivering light throughout the basement. And at the end you can just see there's an open cover, which is an egress. This one on the right hasn't got the basement light shaft installed yet. Left hand side fixed, right hand side opening. A couple more examples of that. And then naturally we have people that come up to us with all sorts of challenges. So this chap on the this one on the left, he'd got a curve. This is a new build, this isn't an old house. Curved dining room, curved wine cellar, wanted the wine cellar full of light, um, but also needed to open in the event of a fire. The one on the right is an old, old building in Bristol. That's a very large one, vented. There's a fire escape top right, and the middle section's got a huge light shaft, and it was a company that was outgrowing its building, and they now have six or seven people working in the basement. So the light shaft cover is a uh, pedestrian load bearing, stainless steel, vented or unvented, surface grills, side grills, upstand grills. You can also have it uh, colored if you need to, if you need to comply with certain requirements to match something. Then hanging beneath, that's the mirror module, which is the essence of the light shaft. And then let's say the top cover, you can have various configurations. So the one on the left, again, that's a London street. The one in the middle, now, this is a very, very busy main road in London. And as you can see, it hasn't quite been finished because the facade of the shop needs to be dressed down over our upstands. That building has got <coughs> underneath it, when the client bought it, she discovered there was a basement apartment that wasn't used because it had a prohibition notice on it due to the lack of natural light. So she got in touch with us and we came and we put in four light shafts. And that basement apartment, which has got two bedrooms, it's, a, it's, it's about a thousand square feet, so it's got two bedrooms, a sitting room, a bathroom, and a kitchen. The basement light shaft is the sole source of natural light throughout. It's the sole source of ventilation throughout. It's the sole source of, of egress. And the local authority gave for a grant of £25,000 for bringing a habit, an unusable habitable space back into use. And we also told her she could get a value-added tax back. So that's a, that's a classic example, and, and that is right on a busy London street. So we had to put in um, systems on the ventilation that would detect unpleasant levels of too much you know, car exhaust and that type of thing to close the vents internally. Right, so code of practice for daylight. This is, as I've mentioned previously, is the way that we decide on daylight in the UK. And it's been touched on in various elements in the previous presentations. The point about a daylit room is that the light inside the, the room changes over time. We know that. The sun comes up, goes down again. The light inside the room changes. And the essence of the code of practice is that rooms in buildings should have a predominantly daylit, pra, daylit appearance during daylight hours, obviously. And as I mentioned several times previously, people in a room should know what it's like outside the room. And the criterion that's used in the code of practice for daylight is the average daylight factor. And that's something that, you know, when uh, somebody's developing a house, there's a, a given ADF for every type of room, and quite often the planners will ask them to prove that they've complied with it. Just in the same way that there'll be a criteria for the insulation of the building, or that type of building code. So the algorithm is used for the ADF, and again, this has been mentioned previously a lot, takes into account the room, size and shape, the reflectances. We've heard already, you could have loads of natural light and paint all the walls black and the ceiling black and put down a black you know, carpet and the place will look dreadful. The position and size of the daylight source is very important. External factors. So this, we, we take into a lot of account what's happening outside because that, we've seen presentations earlier about the overshadowing effect. So we take into account a lot of external factors to make sure that it's not just a window and then three feet away there's a wall. Or if there is, it's not going to comply. And the location. Are we in an urban environment? Are we in a rural environment? Is it clean? Is it dirty? Will it be maintained? And most important of all, the external light level that we've already heard about, zero to 100,000 lux. We do all the planning for codes in the UK at 10,000 lux. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we get allowed to use 25,000 lux. Tends to happen if somebody thinks the building's too important for it not to go through planning. 
they're designing to achieve suitable ADF standards. So that's what drives how we specify the basement light shafts. One of the authors behind the Code of Practice for Daylight is the Building Research Establishment. So because the two light shaft systems that we use are unique, and we were always being asked to prove what we could do, and the systems are not, we believe they're cost effective, but they're not exactly cheap sometimes, although they are less expensive than that earlier slide showed, um, we asked the BRE to write two sets of software for us which could prove compliance with the Code of Practice for Daylight. And it not only allows us to give an ADF output with a report, but it does allow us to actually just give a description for which architects like of just exactly how much natural light is going to get into the room and where. So it doesn't take a lot of imagination to work out that we just flip that software on its head when we're designing it. So we take the room, take the purpose of the room, and work backwards take the external environment, work out where all the overshadowing buildings are, and that'll tell us how to design the light shaft to comply. So, limitless. With our basement light shaft system, we can provide natural light, lots of it. We can provide ventilation, controllable fresh air. We can, there's that means of escape again. And we can make space livable, place to work, and that's a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.